Well, good morning. Man, even the candles are having issues this morning. I will light them during the prelude. Just, you know, that's always been my, my thought. What happens if it doesn't work? And, and my mom watches from home. And she's like, you were having problems. All I could hear was click, 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 click. So, um, well, welcome. What a beautiful day today is. I, I realize it's a little bit overcast, but you know what? The greatest thing that we can all keep in our hearts is that no matter what the weather does, the sun has still risen, as in Jesus Christ is still alive and in heaven. And because he is, then we have life as well. Not only someday in the next world, but life in this world. Remember that Jesus said, I have come that you might have abundant life. Uh, and, and that is the abundant life that he has come to bring to us as we live here and then into eternity. So with that in mind, and with this wonderful uh, worship that we are about to experience, settle back in. If you do have prayer requests, there are prayer request um, cards in your um, pews. Please feel free to fill one out. And on the first hymn, the ushers will come down and will collect any of those and bring those to me. Uh, because truly prayer is one of the beautiful ways that we can connect our minds and hearts with God's. And all that we do brings us closer to God. So as we praise God and look forward to this, let us worship God with beginning with our music.
what a wonderful start to our worship service today. There is a lot going on as we begin a new church year, uh, a lot coming up, including uh, uh, an invitation from our community that Dick handed me this morning. The Four County Young at Heart is celebrating their 50th anniversary. Uh, and they, so they have an open house today from one to four at the um, Young at Heart uh, Center on Flat Rock Road, and everyone is welcome. There will be food and I am also told prizes. Do you know what the prizes are? Nope, you gotta go and find out yourself. Uh, but but there's food, so, um, and and of course, it's, it's our community, so uh, there's lots of fellowship. Um, I always know when I go to something here in the community, even if I don't know who's going to be there, I end up finding somebody that I know, and that is the beautiful thing about a small town. Next week, October 2nd, uh, there's a couple of things going on. During the worship service, we are going to be able to get back to doing something that honestly we haven't done. We've kind of done, but not really uh, during COVID. And that is um, World Communion Sunday. Uh, as I'm sure, I hope that you are all aware, we are not the only ones here in America who celebrate uh, that Jesus is our savior. As Christians, uh, there are Christians worldwide. I know because I've been around the world uh, in different places and I've, I've seen them, I've celebrated, I've worshiped with them. And so we will celebrate that next week. And uh, as we always do, we will have some, um, some special communion elements, um, which uh, we'll, we can talk about. I always, I always take care of those so that we can celebrate communion at least in some small way in the way that our brothers and sisters do around the world. There will also be a special liturgy that reflects the way people worship in other countries. And lastly, uh, for the first time in many years, I'll be bringing in some of the um, uh, artifacts, uh, they're not really artifacts, things that I've brought back from other countries and we'll have a display so that people can see uh, the type of music or worship that others have in, in different countries. Um, then later on in the day at 1 p.m. after I grab a quick bite to lunch, we are going to have our pet blessing, which again, we haven't been able to do in a few years. It begins at 1 p.m. and at 1 p.m. is for cats, small animals, small dogs, that kind of, um, then at 2 p.m. you can bring the larger animals, the larger dogs that the little dogs might think that are going to get eaten by the bigger dogs, which is why we don't put them all together because I made that mistake once. So um, larger animals and, and hey, you know what? Nobody's ever brought a horse if you want to bring a horse. I like horses. Um, I, I like goats. Uh, the only caveat that I will tell you, if you bring a snake, or a tarantula, I make sure it is in a case because I will touch the case. I, I draw the line. I know they're all God's creatures and I will bless it from a distance because that works. Um, then the very next day, October 3rd is our first footsteps Bible study of the season. And we are going to be doing an exploration guided by uh, a book by Max Licato um, on um, how we are embraced by God's love and how we can find God's love in any and all circumstances. So um, I think that will always be um, a good time. We've got good people. Everyone is welcome. No prior bib biblical knowledge is needed. Um, in fact, if you know more than I do, I will just simply put you in charge. So there you go. Uh, we're all on the same playing field when it comes to growing in our faith, because we are all doing that. Lastly, I want to celebrate a couple of birthdays that we have in this next week. Both of them are on Tuesday. So we celebrate on Tuesday with both Beth Bush and Ron Jesse. So happy birthday to both of them. And um, we will have more coming up then in October. So with that, let us uh, sing as we begin our worship. Come, let us praise the Lord.
I love that invitation. Come and praise the Lord. So as one body, as we praise the Lord, first with our voices, and now let us put our hearts together and pray to God together this morning. The psalmist declares that those who live in the shelter of God will find rest in God's shadow. God is our God has promised to watch over us and protect us throughout our lives. Knowing that God is always with us and for us, let us pray. God of protection and provision, we thank you for all that you have given us and all that you do for us. Forgive us for sometimes believing that you have abandoned us in times of difficulty. Remind us of your ever-present love and help as we seek to trust in you. Amen. And now I am going to invite not only the kids to come up, but also one of our resident seminarians, Liesl Higgins. And Liesl is going to be sharing today's children's sermon um, as part of it. I'm probably going to tap her to do stuff like this anyway, so Adam, you can just watch your own taps coming your way. Uh, but this is also, Liesl's doing this as part of a class, so um, I promised that I would give this intro. If it's a little different than the way I normally do it, first of all, Liesl's not me. Um, I'm taller, at least in the moment. <laughs> and... <laughs> And God works through her just as God works through me. So, Lisa? Well, first, I need to grab, grab the supplies. I know that's why you're here. <laughs> I am so glad to see you. So, my name is Liesl, and this is Andrew. And Andrew is my youngest kid. And I asked him to come up here because I thought you might know Andrew if you didn't know me. So today I have a special message, and it's not just for us, it's for everyone, and I'm going to need your help, okay? So this particular story comes from the book of Mark. It's from the first chapter, and it's the first couple of verses. So all you have to remember is if you want to hear the story directly from the Bible, you can go back to your adults and say, can you read for me the first chapter of Mark, okay? So here's what I'm going to need you to do. This is the message. The message is, get ready. Jesus is coming. Get ready. Jesus is coming. So here's what I'm going to need. When I get to the part in the story where you get to help, you're going to know it's your turn because I'm going to do this. And I'm going to point to you. And we're going to say, get ready. Jesus is coming. Okay, so now we're going to try practice. And I think we should let them help us too. What do you think? You think we should let them help? Okay, so you know what your cue is. I'm going to go and I'm going to point, and we're all going to say, Get ready. Jesus is coming. Wonderful. Okay, here's the story. From the very beginning, wise people have been saying, Get, Get ready. ready. Jesus is coming. Now they knew this message because God told them this message. And the message was true because God had given this message. Now, one of the very wise people was a man named John. And everywhere that John went, he had the same message. And the message was, get ready, get ready. Jesus. For one day, after many, many, many days of John telling the people to get ready, Jesus. There Jesus was. 
Jesus came to the very river where John was working and telling the people to get yeah. her. Yeah. Well, the wise people were right because Jesus did show up. And John and all the people were ready because John had been telling them all along to yeah. get her. Jesus. Now, when Jesus came, Jesus could have stayed in a fortress. Jesus could have stayed in a castle. Jesus could have even stayed at the temple or the church. But instead, Jesus came to where the people were. So, John was a wise man. He had heard the message, and the message was, get, get ready. ready. Jesus has come. And Jesus did come. Because God's messages are true. So, if Jesus came to the very river where John was telling all of the people to, get, get ready. ready. Jesus has come. That means that Jesus will come to where we are, to where we learn, to where we live, to where we work, to where we worship. That is a really good message. So all we need to do is get ready. Jesus is a great help me tell the story. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we love you. Thank you so much for the message that you gave to the wise people. Thank you that Jesus comes to where we are, to where we live, to where we learn, to where we work, to where we worship, to where we play. Thank you for coming to where we are. Help us to get ready for you, Jesus, and help us to not only know your message, but to share the message. And that message is get ready. Jesus, Jesus. Is come. Very good. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up here. Would you like? Yes, we would. Good morning. Good morning. This morning's scripture is from the second Corinthians chapter one, verses 18 through 22. As surely as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Sylvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no. But in him, it has always been yes. For in him, every one of God's promises is a yes. For this reason, it is through him that we say, amen to the glory of God. But it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, who has put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a down payment. The word of our Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. If you want a supper, you can have one later. Did you want to? If you want a sucker, I'll give you one later. Our second scripture today comes from Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah's entire book is all about prophecy. Of course, it's in the Old Testament. So Jeremiah is speaking not to Christians, but to Jews, specifically to the people of not even Israel, but Judah. Because at the time that Jeremiah spoke, the nation, because of everybody wanting what they wanted and not wanting to work together, the nation had split. And there was a southern kingdom and there was a northern kingdom. The northern kingdom of Judah is where the temple was. It's where Jerusalem was. So they thought they were better. They thought they had it all together. And so Jeremiah is speaking to them, but it's a tough time. 
Let me read the words and then we'll get into everything that was going on. We find it in the 32nd chapter of Jeremiah, verses 1 through 3a and verses 6 through 15. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which was the 18th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, at that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard uh, that was at the, in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of your uncle Shalem, is going to come to you and say, by my field that is at Antoth. For the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, By my field that is at Anath, in the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this was the word of the Lord. And I bought the field at Anath from my cousin Hanamel, and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales. Then I took the sealed deed of purchase, containing the terms and conditions and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Nerai, son of Manasseh, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase and in the presence of all the Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence, I charged Baruch saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, both the sealed deed of purchase and the open deed and put them in an earthenware jar in order that they may last for a long time. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, house, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Let us pray. God, we do thank you for all the words in, in the Bible, not just for the ones that are in the New Testament that we consider our Christian scriptures, but God, all the words, because Jesus, our Savior, was Jewish, and this history is our history. We are, as our Jewish friends are as well, people of the book. So as we seek your word, your path, your light, and your guidance in this book, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, you would reveal it to us, that we might walk in it all our days. Amen. All right, we'll get to talking about Jeremiah in a moment, but there's something really exciting going on. And, and so I, I got to ask you a question. I want to know, I know that the majority of people here are Browns fans, right? All right. So I want to know um, the, the Browns, I realize we're only three games in to the season. Okay. Uh, but they're, they're one and two. I mean, they, they squeezed out that win on Thursday night. I, I know I, I heard some people thought that it was going to go the way of the second game, but it didn't. So I want to know, who is excited about the Browns going to the Super Bowl? All right, now, of those of you who are excited, how many of you are buying tickets this week? Who's going <laughs> to? John Yanwing's raising his hand. He wouldn't know if I called it the World Series. Uh, Super Bowl tickets aren't cheap, but you know what? I'll bet you can get them cheaper a little bit if you buy them today. You know, I'm sure that the price goes up once everybody knows who's in it, but you guys know who's going to be in it, right? The brownies are going to be there. They're going to dominate all the rest of the games of the season. That, that slow start, that was just an anomaly. They are going to win every other game, and it's not even going to be close. And they're going to get to the Super Bowl through the playoffs, no doubters all the way. And the Super Bowl is even going to be over by halftime. So in addition to your tickets, if you want to book dinner somewhere, go for it. How many of you are dipping into your savings in this next week? 
there are not a lot of hands going up. I, I don't know about those of you at home. Now, now I realize that it's true. Uh, the Browns are still without their star quarterback for another nine weeks. Um, and if he doesn't do what he's supposed to do, it might be longer than that. But um, but but come on, that that can't be what's holding you back. After all, they won on Thursday. Clearly, the the quarterback, everybody's figured it out. They're just going to roll right on through the Super Bowl, don't you think? There's still not a lot of um, not a not a lot of confidence. Well, now you know what Jeremiah might have been feeling like when the word of God came to him and said, "Go by this field." You see, I realized that um, as much as I tried to prepare and, and it was in the scriptures, I'm not sure you quite understand because it wasn't just a matter of we don't know whether or not this uh, this quarterback is going to be able to take us there. We don't know if our uh, defense is going to remain healthy. We don't know if um, I didn't watch the game the other night, so I'm coming up with stuff off the top of my head. We don't know if our wide receivers are going to like break all of their ankles and uh, and not be able to catch a pass. We don't. It's not like that. Jeremiah knew, I mean, literally in the moment that the word of God came to him, the city of Jerusalem was being besieged. Now, none of us have ever been in a siege, but we've heard a little bit about it coming out of the Ukraine. A siege is when the people in the town, in this case, Jerusalem, are surrounded, usually on all sides, and every means is cut off. And it might not be battle in every single moment, but they also can't get supplies. They can't get in. Nobody can get to them. They can't get out. No additional resources. And oftentimes that's how battles in the past went. Just besiege a, a city until the people in town run out of everything that they need. And then it'll be easy pickings. Just go on in and finish it off. And that's kind of what happened with Jerusalem. Even in the moment that Jeremiah was writing this. And as he knew as a prophet, he knew that Jerusalem was going to fall, that Babylon was going to be victorious, that the land was going to be taken from them because the people were largely going to be driven off into exile in a foreign land, into Babylon. And of course, as we know from the scriptures, this is exactly what happened. Of course, in this moment, Jeremiah, as you heard me read, is also in prison. Because you see, when Jeremiah shared this prophecy with King Zedekiah, as you might imagine, he didn't take it all that well. Uh, that would kind of be like going to your Steelers friends and telling them that since the Brownies beat them on Thursday night, that the Browns were now going to walk into the Super Bowl without a second thought. I'm not sure that that's exactly what I'd share with your Steelers friends or anybody else for that matter at this point. And yet this was the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah while he's in prison, while the city is being besieged, while there is really like no hope. And Jeremiah knows better than anybody else that this is not going to end well. Now, admittedly, this uh, purchase that he is being asked to make, this was part of the culture of the day. In fact, it was literally part of the Jewish law in an effort to keep land in the family. Jeremiah had an obligation to buy this land. But really, come on, isn't this like the most foolish purchase that you could ever imagine making? I mean, I'm sure we've all made foolish purchases. I know for me, I get sucked in by all of that stuff that's right by the register. If I have to wait any length of time, forget it. I'm coming home with whatever is there. I am lucky if it's just candy. But otherwise, all of a sudden, all of those little trinket things that are hanging there on the hooks, I absolutely have to have those. I have no, uh, no, I, I can't explain it, but I do. And then, and then my bill is up another 10 bucks because of all of this stuff, this mini brush that I saw that I thought, oh my goodness, I need that. Uh, the, the hand sanitizer, the little Lego toy. Oh, I might be able to use that in a children's sermon sometime. I'm sure that I need that. And don't even get me started on those uh, balls that there's something in it that you don't know what it is. I will buy those every single time. Get it home and go, why did I spend $3 on this? So we make foolish purchases, but, but Jeremiah's purchase, I mean, come on. 
at least whatever is in the ball or the mini brush or the hand sander, I can use all of that. Or I can give it away to someone. This land that he purchased for 17 shekels of silver, this is about to belong to the Babylonians. Not to him. Forget the culture of keeping this in the family. None of the land is about to belong to anybody except the victorious Babylonians. And as I said, Jeremiah knew that better than anyone. He had God's prophecy. He believed God's prophecy. Just because everyone else was sticking their head in the sand didn't mean it wasn't true. There was, at this point, by all evidence around, zero hope for the future of Jerusalem for the future of the temple, and for the future of the land of Israel, of the land of Judah, the land that all of a sudden Jeremiah is anteing up seven shekels of silver for. So either Jeremiah is the worst impulse buyer in the history of humanity and made the most foolish purchase ever, or there's something more going on. And I'm sure that you know, if you've listened to me talk for any length of time, or read the Bible, or seen the twists and turns that we have with God's people, I'm sure that you know that there was something more. You see, the something more was God's promise. Because it wasn't just the prophecy of what was about to happen that Jeremiah knew. Jeremiah also knew as God's word came to him at the end of the scripture, as you heard me read, that there would be a day again when people would buy land, would possess land. Yes, the short term was going to look pretty bleak. It was going to look pretty hopeless, but they could have hope. They would one day again be in that land. They would possess it. It was important to keep it in the family because Babylon, this whole mess that was going on, that was only for a period of time. But there was a future, and that future involved hope. And that hope is in the fact that God is faithful. As Liesl said, God always keeps God's promises. We have a great track record of that. You don't have to take my word for it. You can go back through the Bible. Jeremiah knew that while the people of Israel might have languished in the wilderness of Sinai for 40 years, God had promised the promised land, and eventually, they walked through that uh, river of Jordan into the promised land. They did claim this place where they were. This was what God had promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. This is their land. And so regardless of what might happen in the short term, Jeremiah trusted that God's words are true. He trusted in God's promises. And because he did, because he knew that there was something more that he could hold on to, that despite all evidence to the contrary, there was hope in God, Jeremiah went ahead and shelled out that money and he bought the land. And you'll notice what he did. He knew that he wouldn't possess it anytime soon. That's why he put the deed in earthenware pots. That was the way of preserving documents in those days, which is why, interestingly, that you hear of the Dead Sea Scrolls coming out of earthen pots. Fortunately, we have other ways to do this now. But what I wonder is, do we trust God now as Jeremiah did then? Do we recognize that there's something more? Do, do, are we able to look beyond our current circumstances, however awful they might be, however hopeless, however dire, and look to the God who is always faithful? Look to the God who has never let anyone down. Look to the God who has promised to be there with us, promised to bless us, promised that there is a future with a hope. That scripture is also from Jeremiah. I know the future that I have for you, says the Lord. It's a future with hope. God is saying, don't look around you at what's going on. Don't focus only on that. Look to the future. Know that there's hope because I am in the future. I've created you for eternity. Look to the future in this world and into the next. And trust me, because no matter how bad things seem, and let's face it, things can look pretty bad. 
no matter how they seem, God is still in control. And you know what? I have not read, nor have I heard anyone say that despite everything that happens, that God has changed God's mind about the world. When God created the world, God said, it is good. And you know what? It still is. And that's what we can trust in. Because God created the world. God is in control of the world. If it was up to us, kind of like the Browns, then maybe you don't want to be spending that money on Super Bowl tickets. Because, you know, I mean, let's face it. For human beings, anything can happen. I mean, they squeaked out the win. It's true. But there can be fumbles. There can be interceptions. There can be just stupid decision-making that you scream at your television, or at least I know Diana does because she's posted it. But God doesn't fumble. God's never been intercepted. When God says something's going to be, it's going to be, and we can count on that. That's what Jeremiah knew. That's why Jeremiah made a seemingly foolish purchase. Jeremiah knew that there was more than what he saw in the moment. He was able to look beyond. And so the question becomes, how do we do that? How do we look beyond our present moment? When we're being overwhelmed, when it feels like there is no future, there is no hope, there's nothing ahead. How do we look beyond that? We do it by reminding ourselves of those who have gone on before. We do it by reminding ourselves of God's promises that are faithful every single time. We do it by choosing what we're going to focus on. You've heard me say one of my favorite quotes by Yogi Berra, who is my favorite player of all time, is when you get to the fork in the road, take it. And I know everybody, it's a yogiism, everybody giggles and yeah, ha, ha, ha. But you know, the reality is, is there is an option because a lot of people just stand there trying to figure it out. Take the direction that leads toward God even if it doesn't make any sense, even if it seems foolish, even if you have no idea where the rest of the staircase is, take that step and go toward the one who holds the future. There's only one who has ever been to the future, and that is God, because God is timeless. God is in the present. God is in the past. God is in the future. And so when you trust the future, you are really trusting God, because God's there already. And every future, by the way, uh, Every future that you can imagine, no matter what decisions, what choices people make, good or ill, God is there in that future, just waiting to fulfill God's promises for us. And it's a matter of trusting God, of seeing beyond, of having the courage to do what Jeremiah did, of being able to go forward and do what we're being asked, invest in the future even when there doesn't seem to be a future. And again, we can look at the examples in the Bible. I lifted up that Jeremiah may have thought about the example of the Israelite children out in the wilderness, but we don't even have to go back that far because I guarantee you that there was a Friday in the history of our world when some of the most faith-filled people thought that there was no hope, that all was lost, and that everything they had spent the past three years doing was a waste. We now refer to that as Good Friday, because in spite of the fact that we know that Jesus died on the cross that day, if you look forward, you'll notice that Jesus spent a lot of time, including the very night before he died, preparing his disciples for what to carry on in the church. Because Jesus knew that God's promises are true. Jesus knew that as bad as Friday was going to be, God wasn't just going to restore the land as God promised to Jeremiah and to the Israelites. God was going to restore life to that which death has taken. That's the ultimate promise. And if we can trust in that, we have evidence of that then we can trust God even in the worst of circumstances. Trust that there is a future. Keep moving forward. Keep going where God is leading us, even when we have no idea why or how. Because it does work out. 
I found another example I was curious about, and so I looked it up. Has anyone ever heard of a young lady named Samantha Haviland? Samantha, Samantha Haviland, Haviland is one of the survivors of the Columbine shooting. And what she did with her life, her future, even as uh, hopeless as I'm sure it seemed at that time, friends gunned down around her, trauma resonating through her heart and mind. But Samantha became a counselor and she directed, directed the Denver Public School Counseling Services and helped others. There's lots of evidence of God bringing people through and being faithful with the future that God has promised. God has created all of us for a future. And I can't tell you what it is, but I can promise you that if God has promised it to you, then God is going to be faithful. It might sound impossible, but if we can just focus on God, just believe in God as Jeremiah did, as Jesus did, then we will find that someday all that we thought was lost will be restored as well. And not only restored, but likely there will be tremendous blessings on top of it. So I have no idea what's going to happen in the Super Bowl. I'm not even going to buy particular colors for a party. But I'm absolutely certain that God is still in control and that because God is, this world is still good, no matter what we see, no matter what we experience. And I'm absolutely certain that we can trust God no matter what, because God loves us and that love will overcome all. Amen. Have a seat. And we do praise God because of all of the blessings of all the promises, whether they've been fulfilled in our lives yet or not. And in recognition of that, we give back to God so that places like this can continue to exist and people continue to hear the word either in person or online. So as we come to our morning offering, I invite you to give in gratitude for what you have received so that God may in turn continue to give to others. Will the ushers please come forward?
God, we, as we give back to you from what you have given to us, we do praise you. We sing your blessings because we know that regardless of what we are confronted with on a day-to-day -day basis, your love is sufficient in any and all circumstances. So bless our gifts, God, and use them for the building up of your kingdom in our hearts and in your world. Amen. Thank you all. All right, um, we have a few different uh, prayer requests this morning. A uh, couple that um, came up, let us pray for um, Johnny Childers. Whoops, where, okay, At Leslie's dad. Um, so um, soon to be um, Adam Shanneman's father-in-law. There we go. Uh, he is recovering from heart surgery. And speaking of recovering from heart surgery, let us all continue to pray for um, uh, Dave, who is home. And um, has he gotten into the shop a whole bunch yet? Yep. Okay. So he's good. Um, and uh, David, I got a wonderful text from Virginia. He is at home uh, doing well also. Uh, so we will continue to keep them also uh, and add Johnny to that list as well. Let us also pray for um, Denny who is being treated for prostate cancer. And um, also we want to, of course, continue to lift up Sabrina, um, Sandra's um, goddaughter, who is also battling um, her own, in her own battle with cancer, and uh, Mike Weber as he battles melanoma. Uh, we will continue to pray for Mike um, in this time. Uh, we want to um, pray. I got a, a prayer request from Rhonda. Um, about Oscar, Oscar has been, been diagnosed with fatty cirrhosis of the liver. And so he is on new meds and uh, let us pray that um, these meds do what they are supposed to do and um, his blood counts can come up. At the same time, let us also pray for Rhonda, whose cousin, uh, whom she was very, very close to, passed away earlier this week. And so um, uh, Wanda and Oscar are going through a lot right now. Let's make sure to be lifting them up in prayer because if there is anyone in this congregation who believes in prayer, it's that lady sitting right there. Uh, she is like our star prayer warrior. Um, so I'll just tell you, she raised the bar high for the rest of you. Um, let us also uh, keep in our prayer. This went out on the prayer chain earlier this week. Um, uh, Willie Beauvais, who is the grandson of Dawn and Barry, and the son of Lacey and Brian um, had a, uh, an accident. He choked and um, he is at, um, uh, he was taken to the Toledo Children's Hospital, which as you know, I mean, that's the place you wanna be. I was able to go and visit on, um, on Sunday, um, but as you might imagine, um, uh, you know, Willie's in, in tough, he, he, he has a ventilator, he's on a ventilator. So um, let, us, let us pray. Um, for, for Willie, let us pray for Lacey and Brian, who on Tuesday uh, got the most unimaginable call that any parent can ever get. And let us pray for uh, Dawn and Barry and, and the entire Bove family um, as they go through this difficult time with, um, uh, with little Willie. So um, a lot on our hearts, but um, as, um, uh, as, as Corey Ten Boom's sister, uh, said, um, we need to tell people how big our God is because no matter how deep our troubles, our God is deeper still. So with that assurance, let us go to God. God, we thank you that your love is sufficient in all circumstances. Your love literally overcame death and, and canceled out the consequences of sin through Jesus's efforts, which were done in love. And so God, we know that your love is capable of everything. And so we lift up to you in our moments where we're not sure where to go. Help us through your Holy Spirit to focus on you. When we don't know where the future is, God, remind us through your Holy Spirit that you are our future and that your love will be there for us and that you are in control. And so God, with this confidence, even not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing what the future will look like, we lift up to all of these and everyone who is on our hearts, everyone who is in need. And there are so, so many. 
It can seem overwhelming at times, God, but thank you for the reminder that you really are in control of everything. We might not understand why things happen as they do. And even if we had the answers, it probably wouldn't be satisfactory. Remind us that we can simply trust in you, even when there are no answers. And so with this trust, God, we lift up to you, Johnny and Dave and David. We pray that Johnny would experience the same healing after his heart surgery that Dave and David has. And we thank you for that healing. We lift up Denny, God, as he battles prostate cancer and also Mike as he battles melanoma. We pray for Oscar in this diagnosis of fatty cirrhosis of the liver. God, there's so much around us in Sabrina as she continues in her chemo treatments. But we know, God, that you are greater than cancer. You are greater than cirrhosis. You created us. The psalmist tells us that you knit us together in our mother's wombs. And so we look to you, the author and creator of life, for the thing that we can't do, which is to move forward. Let us move forward in you, God. Let Wanda's family know that as they mourn their cousin's death, that he is with you because this world is not all there is. There is a world beyond this world. Thank you for that assurance and thank you that that's what love has made possible for us. Let us rest in that love and with that love. God, we lift up to you, little Willie, and we pray that you would hold him as one of your own creation, which he is. We pray that you would watch over him and watch over his family. Be with his parents, be with his grandparents, be with all who know and love him. And Willie is part of this family too, God, baptized here into the faith and family of Jesus Christ. And so we pray that you would show all of us ways that we can be your hands and feet for his family and for all who are in need. We pray this, God, through Jesus, who truly showed us the way and became our way. And so it's only right that we end with the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now end as we began. Because God is good, there is always reason to praise God. So let us end with one of my favorite praises. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. <laughs> has done and the love of God that we can count on in all circumstances. Let us leave this place knowing that we are called to more than what we see. We are called to a future with hope. And through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, God makes this possible for all of us. Amen.
Thank you.